Uh, I'm Tom Dowling, the president of the Greater Key Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to our breakfast forum. Um, we've invited the four area college presidents here to talk a little bit about meeting the needs of the 21st century as far as their curricula, how they deal with their students, um, to give us a little bit more information about themselves and their institutions, uh, and have a little dialogue, interaction. Uh, so as, as they go through some of the questions that you have in front of you that we're going to be talking to, uh, please feel free to write down some questions you might have, uh, more information that you might need, uh, because the success of any entity is understanding what the customer needs and then being able to meet that need with either a product or a program or a service. So I'm sure the colleges want to know how it is that they can best serve you and prepare their students for jobs in your company. But ultimately, that's, that's what you go to college for, is to learn and then get a job and leave home. Get out of your parents' house. But that's, that's a personal issue for me. Uh, maybe some of you don't have that. Um, our speakers today are President Helen Giles G. of King State College, Steve Budd of River Valley Community College, Dave Caruso of Antioch University of New England, and Jamie Burge from Franklin Pierce University. Uh, again, I want to thank our sponsor, the Madnock Radio Group, uh, uh, for sponsoring these events. Uh, our host, Bentley Commons, uh, has a beautiful facility. And for those of you who, uh, who would like to, uh, after this session, uh, we have the ability for you to view the, uh, the, the location, go see some rooms. And Patrick's sitting right there. Patrick will be around at the end of our session. So avail yourself to it. It's a magnificent, phenomenal facility uh, that you need to see. Uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to uh, present some questions to the panel and have them, one question at a time, just talk about their institution and, and how it is that they're addressing some of these issues. Um, and then this is kind of a moving issue. So we may take questions right on those questions right then, rather than waiting to the end. And we'll see how the flow goes. Um, again, we've asked them to address a couple of issues. The first is, in the 21st century, the profile of students arriving in your campuses has changed. They come computer savvy, have access to volumes of information that used to be imparted in a classroom. That was the only way they could get it. Now, with the internet, everything's available to them. So, the first question, the first two questions is, how do both programs and classroom change to accommodate these students, and what challenges does this create for you and your facility? So, I'll just start on my left right here, and, oh, I'm sorry, the first thing we need do. The presidents are going to introduce each other. So if we can, again, I'll start right here, and you have someone to introduce. If you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Helen Jowsgee this morning. Uh, Dr. Jowsgee assumed the presidency of Keene State College on July 1st, 2005. Um, she's the longest serving president of this state. <laughs> <laughs> She has over three decades of experience as a professor and administrator in higher education and public institutions. Dr. Zhao Ji's most recently served as provost <coughs> at Rowan University in New Jersey. She was responsible for the entire academic affairs division, which included the graduate school and the colleges of business, communication, art, education, engineering, fine and performing arts, and the liberal arts and sciences. And she was also responsible for information resources, 19 centers and institutes, and the Rowan University campus in Camden, New Jersey. Dr. Giles G. received a bachelor's degree in psychobiology, a master's of science degree in science education, and a PhD in measurement techniques of experimental research from the University of Pennsylvania, and also has a master's degree in zoology from Rutgers University. And she's uh, a wonderful well, good morning. Uh, Dr. David Caruso was appointed president of Antioch University, New England, effective July 1, 2006. He came to Antioch from Worcester State College in Massachusetts, where he served as vice president for academic affairs starting in 2002. Previously, he was dean of the College of Education, Nursing, and Health Professions at the University of Hartford and special assistant to the president and interim director of cooperative education at the University of Rhode Island, where he had also been a department chair and tenured full professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. 
He previously served on the faculty at Purdue University and Indiana State University. He is a developmental psychologist and early childhood educator and holds a BA in liberal arts and an MA in early childhood education from Sonoma State University in Ronert Park, California, <clears throat> and a PhD in child development from C Cornell University. He too is a senior president, uh, the most senior serving president among five Antioch University campuses. Good morning, everybody. Dr. James Burge was appointed the fourth president of Franklin Pierce University by the Board of Trustees in April of 2009 and assumed his official duties on June 15th. He most recently served as Executive Vice President, Chief Operating Officer at Wheeling Jesuit University in Wheeling, West Virginia, where he also served as Interim President from 2006 to 2007. In addition to overseeing academic affairs, Dr. Burge managed the strategic planning process implemented an enrollment management model for stabilizing and growing enrollment and implemented the restructuring of the university's long-term debt. Before that, Dr. Burge served as executive director of Pennsylvania Campus Compact and was coordinator for service learning at Regis University in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Burge holds a PhD in leadership studies from Gonzaga University an MED in Guidance and Counseling from Plymouth State University here in New Hampshire, and a BS in Elementary Education from Westfield State College in Massachusetts. And I'll have you know from our discussion this morning as we were getting to know each other, uh, we know that Dr. Burge has completed one year, and that's what makes you a successful president. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, there's my president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
we know we have to do these team projects, and so we'd be able to dump our materials on the web, view them, correspond in our groups. And so I had to learn as a faculty member how to do all those things. So the expectations that students have for technology is that faculty are adept at the kind of technology that facilitates their learning, as well as that the milieu that we provide for the experience includes not a space for them just to get together in person, but a space for them to get together online. I would certainly echo uh, everything Helen has just said. And one of the differences between my college, which is largely, well, it's entirely a commuter college, and I draw people on a daily basis from all across New Hampshire and, uh, and Vermont. So one of the areas in the curriculum that has been growing exponentially as compared to other aspects of the curriculum is online learning. And there continues to be a considerable debate around where online learning is effective and where it is not. But where we have recently come down uh, on this issue is using a blend of uh, online opportunities for students to interact with each other and faculty, and then to ensure that we also bring people on campus uh, uh, to, uh, you know, for, for various meetings of their, of their courses face to face. So that's still, uh, you know, that's still out there, you know, being fine-tuned, and, uh, but it's all part of an effort to achieve what we see as our core mission, which is access to higher education for greater and greater numbers of you know, students. Now, as Helen had said, it's certainly a challenge for faculty to be able to get up to speed with the various technologies that are now available to them to improve and expand their teaching. And this has largely been a very, very good thing because as we draw more and more diverse students into our classrooms, you know, we have to be mindful of the variety of learning styles that those students, you know, bring to the classroom. And by offering instruction with a blend of lecture, a blend of technology, um, is, you know, in our view, the best way to reach the majority of students in the classroom. Now, you know, technology is a double-edged sword. And I, you know, need to say that one of the challenges that is posed by tech savvy students is to, to understand you know, what is good information, you know, what is a reliable source of information. We still need to work with students to understand the difference between a primary source and a secondary <coughs> source, an opinion piece you know, versus a factual piece, you know, a blog versus a research article. Uh, those continue to be, or even more so, challenges to us. And I would say finally that we also must work with our students more than ever in understanding what plagiarism means. And you know, one more comment you know, regarding plagiarism is that it's not always uh, an issue of the student trying to, to exert subterfuge. And sometimes it's really a needs to be taught to understand you know, the difference between plagiarism and, and original work. Thanks. Good morning. Certainly it's humbling to be here on this panel. So uh, I haven't quite completed the first year. I'm, I'm hoping for those last few weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but thanks for inviting me here this morning, Tom. And thanks for being here. Um, you know, I guess uh, you know one of my greatest concerns about uh, the technology that is available to young people today and the skills that they bring to campus is that there is a, an, a, a, a tremendous emphasis on efficiency. And technology brings lots of efficiency uh, to a learning process. My concern is that that comes at a cost sometimes, uh, and that cost is effectiveness. And as Steve just said, on occasion, that means that students stumble into areas that they may not be aware of, particularly related to using somebody else's material that they think is their own original work. And that because of the efficiency of being able to draw material and create their own um, work, uh, sometimes they stumble into these areas that are that are dangerous for them, and it is an incumbent on, I think, higher education and faculty in particular 
to help students understand that while technology can create efficiencies, there also has to be a focus on being cautious and intentional about the kind of work that they're doing. You know, sometimes the criticism of higher education is that it moves at the, it changes at the pace of a speeding glacier. Uh, there's a reason for that, I think, and that is because we want to be intentional about how we uh, create and share knowledge uh, so that it isn't reckless, so that it does have important meaning to our students and to communities. And so we also have to understand that, you know, students are coming, coming to us with this need for speeding up and we're trying to slow them down, down in some ways to help them understand material more carefully. And those two cultures can clash. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in our house, we have three daughters uh, uh, between 12 and 19. And uh, it's uh, usually my 12 or 14 year old that I, when I have problems with my computer at home, I ask them, what do I have to do? Because they know the material from being at friends' houses, from being in classes that I didn't benefit from as a child. Uh, but they have that literally at their fingers, and they know how to respond to issues related to technology that I that I didn't have. Uh, but at the same time, they go about that in a rote process. They don't think about what does this mean, or how does the process that they're using to fix the computer, or whatever's wrong with it, how does that relate to the next time that happens, and how can we avoid that? They just say, well, here's the problem, and I'll fix it, rather than being more intentional about what happens uh, later on, and how does this process, or my knowledge, help us avoid these problems in the future? So I think sometimes technology uh, can be uh, a, a, a troublesome spot when we go about invoking its use without being more intentional about the outcome of the work. Well, uh, our campus is a bit different from uh, the other three at, at the table, although maybe for, for more similar in some ways, ironically, to the community college that uh, Steve is the president of, and that we're a graduate school, so we do not have um, undergraduate students right out of high school on our campus. All of our students are between 23 and 73. <laughs> uh, many of them look like all of us sitting in this, in this room here today. And uh, we have a real bifurcation, uh, interestingly, between the uh, students who are 20-somethings on our campus, and there are about 30% of our students are between 23 and 30 to 31, who have graduated from undergraduate schools in the era of the internet in the last 10 to 12 to 14 years and are very technologically savvy who come to uh, advanced graduate study with the expectations that our environment will be infused with technology mediated learning opportunities and then we have 56 year olds who uh, have to find their you know, 12 or 14 year old daughter to help them figure out <laughs> how to get a certain uh, YouTube video to play you know, properly. Um, so, and, and all of these uh, really wide age range and wide experience with technology sit in the same classes in the same programs. Uh, so it's quite an interesting environment. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, information technology and its ubiquitous access in our society and certainly in education has transformed our, our uh, enterprise in higher education. And that transformation continues almost every day a new technological approach. It hits the marketplace. Uh, I was at a meeting last week, uh, and you might have seen all the hype about Apple's new iPad, the Slate uh, tool that just came out. And I was at a conference uh, two weeks ago where three different campus presidents said they were giving a, a free, brand new iPad to every incoming freshman. You all might want to think about that. Uh, loaded, loaded with everything they need to know about that campus, the student handbook, everything they need to know about it, their medical services and everything else, residence life, plus all of their syllabi and textbooks for all of their classes during the first year as e-books loaded right on the iPad, free. That's about a thousand dollar piece of technology with all this stuff loaded on it. So it, it's certainly true that tech, uh, information technology will continue to drive in powerful ways ways teaching and learning and our experience of learning either whether whichever side of that uh, divide we're on whether we're the learner or the teacher and I think it has accelerated the change in our industry from you know what uh, metaphorically people call it you're either the sage on the stage and most of us remember that from our education experience where someone is at the front of the room with a 
blackboard and a piece of chalk lectured for 40 minutes while we frantically tried to write down something close to what they were trying to get us to learn, versus another approach which is called guide on the side, where the students engage deeply with each other, where there's a lot of peer learning, and the instructor, or who, who you might think of as the teacher, is more of a, of a mentor and guide who helps students find what was referred to by Steve and, and James as the, the information that's the most uh, acceptable and the most uh, positive for students to interact with in that learning experience. Anyone else have a comment before we? Yeah, as we listen to that, one of the challenges that we face with technology is having the bandwidth to accommodate all of this. Because the technology expands not just the, the PC, but also through the disciplines there is the integration of technology specific to that discipline. It used to be that you'd only think of the sciences or, or for having technology, and even that's expanded. But now you're looking at graphic arts, you know, film studies, you know, digital cameras, <coughs> and students making films that end up on YouTube, and, um, and even with their, their cameras, <coughs> that you could be given a speech and end up on YouTube. I mean, so it's all across, but having the bandwidth to be able to do that, having wired buildings that were full of concrete um, costs, and so how to incorporate the cost of technology or the ability to have it in a region with bandwidth that's a bit low, um, it, it's, it's a concern and something that we grapple with. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. Infrastructure for us is one of the biggest technology issues that we have. Uh, it, it's not only costly in terms of, uh, you know, buying the equipment and the, the material that we need for that, but it also is costly in our relationship with the community because we eat up all that bandwidth and it makes it difficult for local communities. So we have a concern about that as well. And, and in fact, that's one of the considerations we make when we think about, you know, how do we advance our technological position. Um, the other piece I wanted to talk a little bit about what David had said, you know, it, it is interesting to see these institutions who are kind of, you know, ponying out these iPads for, for new students. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, we saw the same thing happen when um, iPods came out, when you could podcast and, you know, in fact, Duke University was, I think, the first one to give out, the most notable institution to give out these iPods at the time. Um, and and I, uh, my criticism is that I think that's kind of gimmicky at first if it is focused on just giving out this piece of equipment um, because it doesn't really prepare the student for how to use that. And in many instances, the institution isn't prepared on how to use that. Now, I think it is, it, it is an important learning device if, as David described, you're loading it with uh, software that helps the stu student learn. You're connecting it to the Blackboard or the course management, course material management system that you have. If you're putting on the textbooks, if it is indeed becoming a learning tool and the institution is presenting it as such, by all means, that's that's a great instrument. It's a great opportunity to advance not only the campus but the students' understanding of the use of technology. But when institutions just hand out the iPad or a laptop or an iPod without that supporting educational component, it is just a gimmicky approach to improving students. Well, for those of you who know me, I'm technologically challenged. Um, and when I found Google and Craigslist, I thought I'd go into the mountain. I mean, like, <laughs> Google anything and find it. It, it was terrific. So um, again, let's open it up for some questions. Anybody have any questions? Susan? I, I have one. Um, my source of information is always uh, NPR. So I'll, I'll just share a quick question uh, based on that. The other day I heard um, a report that a college professor in the front of the class had the ability to cut off, I think it was internet, but it might have been something else at the front of the class. Because as everybody's taking notes on their laptop, they're really not taking notes. Mm -hmm. They're on Facebook or they're, they're doing other things on their laptop. And I was amazed that there was something that the professor could do at the front of the class which limited the class's ability to do all those other things besides um, take notes. Do you know anything about that? I mean, you're talking about advanced technology. Yeah, yeah sure, Sue. Um, you know, we, we have to presume that we're all working with adults. Okay, so once you come to a college campus, you're, you're an adult and we expect adult Sorry. behavior from, from students. <laughs> now, I have a particular advantage here uh, uh, from those campuses that have problems with students, students and cell phones. So on my Claremont campus, 
I have no cell phone connectivity. <laughs> you, you can't make a cell phone call. Easy answer. So, you know, that presents its challenges. But we also have wireless throughout the building. But it's almost, you know, sheepish to say that uh, at times we do turn off the wireless in the classroom if it becomes a classroom management issue. And that does happen sometimes. Other questions? Anybody else? I, 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 feel, I just made a comment earlier. When we first introduced ubiquitous wireless access on campuses and, and students could bring their laptops into the classroom and ostensibly perhaps use them to take notes, but they, of course they could be at Amazon.com buying something while the professor's talking about chemistry or whatever. Uh, and we had a lot of faculty concern about that at several places that I worked, and I really don't think we should, we should worry about that that much. I mean, we've all... You know, there are many ways that every student has had the opportunity to space out in class. I mean, you know, when I was in high school, a lot of my friends would bring in a Marvel comic book and hide it inside their chemistry book and read it, you know, during chemistry class. And college students can certainly do the same thing. Um, just all the way to, you know, watching a movie in your mind and staring out the window spaced out and not hearing a word that's being said. So um, the professor can just as easily say, now I want everyone to close their laptops, watch them do that, because I'm going to talk about something I want to write on the board, and you, you all need to look at that. And the, the typical 19-year-old will comply with that kind of direction. You know, the, the, uh, the tradition of this kind of active passing, passive learning environment where the sage on the stage is lecturing at the students in the classroom is quickly becoming obsolete. Um, today, students have, more so today than when I was uh, a student, have the capacity for a variety of learning strategies at the same time. And let me give you a great example. Um, if you have a, a teenage son or daughter um, and you've ever seen them uh, participating in these, uh, these chats with multi multiple friends, uh, you know, and they've got you know, literally four or five conversations up on the screen going at the same time, they have a capacity for um, multiple learning strategies that, that eluded me and, and still do in some ways. Uh, that that we have to embrace in the classroom, and so while there may be occasions where students are kind of goofing off and you know looking at you know the, the local ESPN scoreboard uh, in classroom, it's also the case that those students might be looking for additional information about the content of the lecture. And why shouldn't we encourage that? You know that is uh, acknowledging <coughs> a curiosity that we want to instill in our students, and, and to cultivate that is an important academic role for us. Uh, and, you know, regardless of how you manage the classroom, there will always be students that want to be managed differently or managed not at all. Uh, but it's the role of the faculty member whose profession is to teach to embrace that student's particular need or desire and find a way for him or her to find the content or the knowledge that needs to be found by the student. So. We've had to establish expectations of our students. We now have an interim convocation because we realize that they need to know what we expect of them in the classroom and regarding their learning, and that that's why they come to college, because we do get the uh, developing adult. Um, <laughs> who are some, the first time they're away from home, and they're coming to do some other things in addition to learn. <laughs> and so we found it necessary to march them into the gym and say to you, you know, don't miss this opportunity. It will go by fast. And we also have had to have workshops with faculty who weren't used to the new students um, to say to them, you need to be able to say to the students what your expectations are up front because these classes are different. Because they were appalled that students would come in and they also wearing hats, cell phones going off, iPads, etc. They weren't used to that because they were used to the respectful so um, the changes have impacted everybody. But I think we, like you, have to be clear of the expectation is to learn to get a degree and we want them to be successful. And, um, and so we have had to issue a little bit of tough love when they come in to make sure that they begin on the right track as they develop into um, more mature adults. Good. Um, I'd just like to add one thing. Knowing a little bit about how higher ed is funded, um, I think that people should be aware of how technology has changed the funding paradigm for colleges. 
and how um, at risk many are of actually having more of a digital divide between those colleges that can afford to have wireless access, the iPads, the things that we're talking about, and many of the public institutions, for instance, who where technology is extremely expensive and the funding isn't there to bring us up to speed. Um, so there, and it's something that we're very cognizant of as we try to do what we need to to make sure that our graduates are prepared to go out into a technology-heavy business environment. There was a sage on this stage uh, at Michigan State University who used to lecture. Um, and when he wanted to make sure the students got it, he would stop his foot two times. And that meant this was going to be on the final. So everybody was going to pay attention to what that said right now. And that's how, that's how he got the Marvel comic book clothes. That's how he got <laughs> stop his foot twice. And then everybody pay attention. Well, he was to <laughs> so, yes, I am dating And it's not difficult for me to date myself. But actually, if you, you know, if you, I, 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 I love Google. But it also made me some money because when I found Google, I went, my God, for all of us people my age, this is phenomenal. How do you buy a stock in this? And it was very early on in the age of Google. So, you know, again, understanding what you don't know sometimes can benefit you a lot. So I love Google. Google is my friend. Um, the next question is, um, how do you gather information on what industry needs will be, both academically and technically, to develop curricula and to guide students in training and educating themselves for jobs of the future? And how have you engaged the business community to know and understand those demands? Let's start with, uh, uh, with Jamie, if you will. Sure. Well, you know, I think that, uh, uh, as I said, you know, when, when we've got this, uh, you know, higher education institution that changes at the pace of a speeding glacier with uh, a rapidly changing uh, workforce, uh, sometimes those are cultural clashes that we need to be more sensitive to uh, in higher education and in the work, workforce. Um, for us at Franklin Pierce, we try to find out uh, through our alumni network what's happening in their fields. Uh, we have roughly 15,000 alums. We have regular communications with them in all sorts of fields from communications to teaching to health professions to ask them what's happening in their, uh, in their fields that our students need to be uh, currently aware of. Um, typically, we bring those alums back. We have a variety of panels throughout the academic year so that those panels of alums can speak with the students, either in biology or whatever discipline they might be in, to learn more about what's happening in the field. That also happens to benefit our faculty who uh, sometimes can become isolated, even within their own field. They get accustomed to teaching a particular way or a particular set of content, and uh, without knowing it, they become isolated. And so for them to be more engaged with our alums to stay connected with them, which happens to be a fairly strong characteristic for the institution uh, of alums and faculty staying connected, uh, they have an opportunity to know what's happening outside of the campus. So uh, one of the strategy, strategies we use is making sure that we connect our, our current students and uh, faculty with our alumni. David? Well, our, all of our master's and doctoral programs are practitioner-oriented programs. And we find it being very organic, Tom, that our faculty and students are engaged with the professional communities that they're training our students to enter uh, professionally when they leave graduate school. All of our programs require more than one practicum experience or internship out in the, in, in the profession that they'll be working in. Our faculty are deeply engaged with the professional communities that they are training students to be in. So it's just an ongoing interchange on our campus between world and the uh, world of academia. Um, we're not a ivory tower sort of institution. I mean, our faculty and students kind of live in the basement of, of the professions where, uh, where the world is changing uh, constantly and they're adapting to that constantly. We do bring uh, professional representatives to our campus multiple times during the year. We have practical fairs. We have internship fairs and things like that, but I think most of it happens organically for us. Yeah, as David is saying, uh, practical experiences for students uh, going out and doing hands-on practice in the field that they're being trained for you know, does give an opportunity for those employers in which they're placed to give us the kind of feedback on how our students are, are performing. Now, my college is largely 
Well, we were founded as career and technical institutions. And minimizing the role that's evolving today, uh, more and more, of academic transfer to baccalaureate colleges. But with a largely health occupations-based curriculum, most of our students do go out and do clinical practice in nursing, in respiratory care, in uh, physical therapy, in occupational therapy. So you know, students, on one hand, are afforded you know, the experience in the workplace to ensure that they are familiar with the workplace once they graduate, but then again, it's also that feedback mechanism from, uh, from those clinical sites back to us. Now also, every one of my programs requires a business and industry advisory board. So at least twice annually, the board is generally comprised of uh, business and industry leaders, uh, HR people, uh, graduates of ours that have been working in the field, but they come back twice each year to review the curriculum and to vet changes in the curriculum. So that's another very direct uh, 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 path of, of input from employers into, uh, into the curriculum. Um, King State College, as you know, began as a normal school to, to train teachers, but it's emerged as the only public liberal arts college in New Hampshire. And the role of this liberal arts college and the faculty has been to study what the needs of an educated individual um, is for the 21st century. And basically, when I talk to business leaders, some of the skills and knowledge that you want, basically good judgment, listening, um, the ability to think critically. And so a lot of these um, were defined as essential learning skills, um, inquiry and analysis. Uh, written and oral communication. And so what the faculty did was to totally rewrite the curriculum a couple years ago and embed these requirements into the curriculum of the general education. Additionally, um, we've been brought up with uh, learning the disciplines as silos, biology here, chemistry here, English over here, but we know the real world is not like that that they need to be integrated so the students understand that you don't learn in the real world these things this way. And so the curriculum now is integrated. And in order for a faculty member to actually deliver a course, it has to pass the muster of a, a, of a peer review to assure that it actually embeds these learning outcomes into the course and it is in an interdisciplinary way. Uh, for example, we just had a conference on quantitative literacy on the campus, and it was the, the uh, mathematics of origami. And I had never thought of the topic, but um, very interesting now to mathematics to talk about art and math together, biology of uh, history, and, and having a thematic approach so that students don't believe that only during their senior year must they learn how to bring all the information they learned to, in college together but it is a natural way we learn. It should be all along. Additionally, across the disciplines, we expect our students, be it architecture, teaching, graphic arts, to go out again and work with uh, businesses and nonprofits in the field and develop projects around what their discipline is and actually serve the community that way. We call that service learning. As a result, I think if you've read the Sentinel, you've seen some of the products of this work from students in sociology helping nonprofits write grants um, and get funded, or our architecture students working with, say, the library <laughs> and, um, and actually finding out the plans for, for design for a building, or in Jaffrey doing a design for the whole town in terms of master planning. The students get a practical experience, oral experience, by presenting that back to the person they work with. And um, again, judgment. Because who wants a worker who comes in and every day you have to tell that worker, now go do this, now go do this. You've done that, now go do this. The person has to be able to think on his or her own. And, and where I grew up and thought, wow, I, I've got to get my resume take it out and get a job. The expectation has to be that our students are more innovative. 
They've got to be entrepreneurs because most businesses are mom and pop industries where people come up with ideas and develop their own. And so that's what we're working toward. The, the idea that any person within our college, we're not there yet, can go out and with the correct business plan, make a way for themselves in the world. And I do mean the world. So, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a transition. It's taking time and we're evaluating how effective we are. And it's coming. I have a question. Um, what, what we, we at the chamber and, and with our local businesses and, and some of the interactions we have, what we hear so much is the lack of soft skills from students. Students coming out of college, wherever. The baseball cap on, they come to work, they're not dressed appropriately, they're not on time, they're not, they're not dedicated, they're not reliable. Um, um, talk to that issue and, and what, what role do you think your institutions have in, 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 in helping them to better understand and getting them to do some of the things that we just take for granted, many of the older people just take for granted, um, that, that, that in fact they don't. So, anybody? Yeah, well, let me respond to that. And, you know, Tom, if you had not brought it up, I was thinking that as you were uh, speaking. But I was going to, you know, to say, you know, to, to the people here that the, the biggest single concern that I hear when I'm in conversation with business and industry folks like yourselves is this issue of, of soft skills. What does that mean? Well, interpersonal skills, getting along with each other, working in teams, you know. It seems to me, you know, over and over again, I hear that those are the kinds of things that, that are missing. And rarely do I hear from you concerns about you know, deficits in the technical skills in which we've educated our students. So, you know, by and large, that's not the problem, but the soft skills is. And a number of things that have been said this morning around the table, around service learning, around internships, around clinical experiences, and then, you know, what Helen just said about getting students, you know, out into the community to apply their learning hands-on, you know, I think is a big step, you know, in, in the direction of learning soft skills that might have been learned elsewhere in another day. But now it is incumbent upon us as informal educators to, to provide that. Now, something that Helen also said that I have to echo and agree with very, very firmly that, you know, then this is kind of a back to the future comment, but the liberal arts, the English, the history, the, uh, the math, and the science are all strong foundations for soft skills, and that we really need to integrate, particularly in an institution like mine, okay, with a career and technical curriculum, you know, to ensure that the ability to speak, the ability to write, the ability to reason you know, need be embedded in the way we ask our students to do assignments. Um, so, you know, I see you know, one of my primary tasks is bringing in the value of the liberal arts into career and technical education because I think this separation of liberal arts and career, career and technical to me has always been a very false dichotomy. It shouldn't exist that way. Just a general comment about that, Tom. Yeah, I think there has been sort of a, a real sea change in our society, and I think Stephen alluded to this. I, mean, I think those, a lot of those soft skills used to be taught in the high school, in the family, where behavioral expectations were much more narrow and constrained for young people, especially in families where those young people were expected to go to college. Um, when I graduated from high school in the 60s, you're probably like dating yourself, um, only 28% of high school graduates went on to post-secondary education. And today it's almost 70%. Uh, very few of those people in my generation were people of color and people from low-income families and so on. So we have a much more diverse, uh, population in our colleges now from a wide range of family and high school and community experiences. And I think it is very different. And the, we're, the higher education experience of students today is much more uh, dependent on by society to ensure that people have those soft skills as they leave their educational experience and move into the workplace. And, um, and I, 
I agree, and I think a, a large part of it has to be through experiential learning. Getting, getting our students out into the world, into the, the workplace environment, while they're still students, which both raises their uh, understanding of the knowledge base they're studying, and also gives them experience with the socialization components of uh, the modern professional environment. Other questions? Yes. Not so much a question, but just a comment. Um, Mary Gillard, with United Way, for those of you that, um, that I don't know, but one of the things that we were um, able to do, and Nancy was very um, instrumental in this, reached out to Keene State a couple of years ago and talked with the management um, professor there, John Papalardo, and what he built into the curriculum an opportunity for the students to work with us in a program at United Way called Loaned Employee Program, where they go through a week's worth of training with us, and a lot of these soft skills are built into that. There's communication, there's team building, there's a lot of things like that that are part of the training that we do. They go out and they work with businesses during the campaign. They're interacting with CEOs. They're interacting with um, HR department leaders and different folks within the communities. And we've had great success with that program, and we're you know we're very pleased to to see that kind of outreach um, from our local from our local college. On the statement or a personal note that there has to be that emphasis on how we communicate in a written environment or an online environment. There's a real challenge there, there's no question, because being in an online environment creates a little bit of anonymity in the sense that people may know who you are, but you know they may not see you uh, if it's not video uh, supported. And so there are some protections there for people and they might feel more comfortable being rude. I see it in, in our professionals, yeah. frankly, at the institution when they communicate and, um, you know, it, of course, as presidents, we hear all the complaints, right? Every small complaint comes to the president, uh, but people who are really offended by the way a colleague wrote to them. Uh, and the, the limitation to that kind of communication is that uh, it is devoid of intonation. It's devoid of that soft element. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and so for us, it's a, a, about reminding each other when we're together to say, this is an academic environment where we respect, respect alternative viewpoints and we respect each other. While we may not agree with each other, we'll respect each other and we'll interact with them on that kind of a level. You know, part of being in a residential campus is that the education is not just inside the classroom, but it's how the students relate to everybody on, in, within the campus community. And so the liberal education is true about learning and knowledge, but it's also about the development of character and citizenship. And those are some of the other um, purposes that we see that our college uh, experience has to afford students. So our expectations are for our students to be involved in service to the community, to, um, to vote, to do the, the, the types of things good citizens do, because at the end of it, this whole education is supposed to afford them not just a way um, to earn a living, but a way to live a better quality for not only themselves, but also the communities in which they live. And so um, the types of activities um, that they're engaged in, uh, Habitat for Humanity, um, cleaning out the Ashwood River, are supposed to show them that, they, that the world is bigger than just themselves. And um, in, in that regard, there is a need to bring them back to civilization, as it were, in, in that there is a community of that they exist in. And so um, the whole purpose of our education is to present them with a broad view of the world and of themselves in it. And, and with regard to those soft skills, um, most of the students, we have all this great food that the commons that they eat pizza. And so after four years, they forget how to use a knife or fork. And so um, that alumni center that you see developing there, our alumni are coming back with our viewers and uh, presenting workshops with them about how to present themselves in the best light to employers, how to dress. Maybe you have a few too many earrings, um, you might not want to wear them. And those are practical things that a, a person who graduated from the institution can come back and softly tell them, and are pleased to tell them. And they can look at this person as being successful because they graduated from the same institution. So that building is not just a gathering place for people just to have fun, but for our career planning and, and placement and workshops so that our, our students can go out into the world and, and, and succeed in every way possible. Good, uh, good morning. I'm Skip Marsh from the Society of Manufacturing Engineers out of Dearborn, Michigan. Um, I live in Cheshire County. I work here. I own a business. From a business standpoint, I have two questions. Number one, what are you doing as an institution to outreach to us in manufacturing? Because manufacturing is what's going to grow and keep the United States going. And second of all, we found at the SME level, traveling the country and being in leadership programs, uh, we found when we get down to the grade school level, <clears throat> the middle school level, and the high school level, we engage in the students on soft skills. This has made a heck of a difference. As your institutions, how do you address these two questions? This is yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is good. How are you? It wasn't a plan. It wasn't a plan. <laughs> <laughs> threw a softball pitch to us. Now we're going to knock it out of the park. Go ahead. Well, with all due respect to the private colleges that are at the table here, we have not fully reached out to them yet. But I can tell you that one of the efforts that uh, the public institutions have engaged in over the last two years, specifically, is to bring the public secondary education meaning the school district uh, and the community college and the state college together to look at, in particular, the needs of the manufacturing industry. Uh, uh, and the way that is happening is that, you know, when I came a couple of years ago and began conversations with Helen, with Tom, uh, and, and Sue Newcomer, and largely led by the chamber, is that we were brought together with uh, business and industry folks from around the Monadnock region, and you know listened to you know the concerns around the continuity of, of educational pathways, if you will. I mean that's our jargon, but how do you go from a high school program to a community college program to uh, a baccalaureate program and beyond? How do we use our resources at the 
high school level, community college, and the state college, how do we use our resources collectively to create efficiencies you know, that allow us to build not only instructional you know, curricula that is laddered, if you will, but also have access to the kind of technology to, to do the best teaching that we can do at, at every level. So uh, recently, the state college and the community college, the school district, and the chamber uh, signed a memorandum of understanding creating the Regional Center for Advanced Manufacturing. And we've begun with a facility on the Keene State campus, the uh, Adams Technology Center, which is being refurbished and rebuilt you know, into a more modern facility. And then the high school, the, the technical high school, the adult education programs, uh, uh, within uh, adult community education, which is part of the secondary schools, uh, our community college with our certificate program in machining and machine tool technology, and a whole lot of curriculum advancement, you know, that Helen can speak to on her campus with uh, uh, sustainable product design. Um, we're looking at all of those curricula and developing links between those curricula and then also figuring out how we're going to use the Adams Technology Center together. And to be able to, to all of us take advantage of that wonderful facility that's coming together. Right, good point. I just follow up on that. Yes. Working with Helen in college, I've been involved in that program for five years. Mm -hmm. I've watched that program from two coffees bumping together and saying, we're going to make it happen, we watch it happen. Yeah. Um, some of the soft skills that some of you may not know about is the safety issue. And safety is a big component of Keene State College. When Johnny or Sally hits the floor, safety glasses every five minutes. And you don't want to have to tell them to put on toe protection as a pinch point here. I want them to look at the safety guards, I want them to wear ear protection. Keene State has made a full circle of not only just giving them a good education, but giving them the soft skills that we need as manufacturers. Well, thank you, because the safety program at Keene State is one of the jewels across this country, one of the few safety and occupational health programs. We also have occupational safety health administration centers, one of 11 in the nation, that, that educates uh, firefighters, um, police, et cetera, regarding safety. And it's nice about that program, too, is that um, we could build in a component program that would specifically deal with manufacturing. Um, education across the districts have asked us also to look again at teacher education in the industrial arts, et cetera, because those programs had died out, but there's a big need given, what is it, over 70 manufacturers in this region. We stand to be in the future what the Silicon Valley used to be for California. And to maintain manufacturing in this area would be the greatest boon to the state in revenue development and jobs that, that I could foresee. And to have employers in our region having jobs go vacant because we're not educating people in our region to take those jobs um, made no sense. And so uh, the consortium of working together to provide employees across the ladder who could go into a job at one level, leave and be educated at an institution and keep going back and forth and advance and provide the needed workers for these industries makes a lot so um, the challenges um, are some of the programs that we need that you know, don't exist right now in this region, such as engineering and how to bring that in. We recognize that. But I think the opportunities that we have outweigh the challenges because um, the conversations directly from business and as soon as I link to business is what we're saying, tell us what you need and also we'll tell you what we'd like to have our students experience and then see how we can make those work together. So um, it's an exciting endeavor, and uh, we look forward to it. Yeah, I, I'd like to echo that point that uh, Helen just made, that you know, it, it, it's helpful to hear from you what it is that you're looking for in employees and from our graduates. Um, I don't know of any presidents, uh, although this is my first year as a president, I've worked with presidents for a number of years. And I don't know of any that aren't receptive to working with the business community here. What it is, what is, what it is that's needed 
in graduates. Uh, sometimes there's not a match. Uh, many times there is. Uh, and I think uh, I, would, I would guess with great confidence that all of us here at this table, in fact, presidents around the state, are open to hearing your input about what it is that you'd like to see in the graduates. You know, just, just a little follow-up. This, this region, this area, is, is unique in its ability to bring together coalitions and people of, of, of like thinking or, or who, who have a piece of the answer to the puzzle uh, to bring them together and join together, both public and private people, um, to build these coalitions and these partnerships. Uh, um, certainly on manufacturing, um, the Adams Technology Center, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been raised we've applied for grants so the program can go on. Sue Newcomer has done phenomenal work relative to bringing together the private sector, the manufacturers, and then helping to round up the herds and put them around a, a little circle and circle the wagons so that we can, in fact, build this facility that will educate college students, um, people who work in manufacturing facilities who want to enhance their skills, uh, for manufacturers to come in and do prototypical work on, on new products in this facility. Um, it's going to be a regional center, so it's going to be open to a lot of people for a lot of uses. Um, I don't know how many communities in the country this would have ever happened in, but it, it, it's happened here, and I, and I think, you know, to our, to our benefit, and hopefully we will, we will maximize the use of this. Uh, Helen was talking about, and, and Steve were talking about, integrating the ladders. I mean, there are so many agreements now where there's reciprocal agreements where, where, where people who, who, who gain knowledge and take courses and successfully complete courses at the community college level are now being accepted at the college level. I mean, all these things are, are somewhat recent uh, happenings. And, I, and, I, and again, I just think that the college is working together, getting to know each other, understanding the need, our needs. Um, uh, they can do about anything in this region they are, who they are, and the kind of people that they are. You know, there's also the need for government to be at the table, and um, Senator Kelly's at the table. Also, um, with um, Congressman Hose, who supported with uh, funding. But the need for this region, and um, I've only been here five years, so I know it takes successive generations to actually say you've been here long enough. <laughs> so I'm going to speak with the viewpoint of someone who's coming from the outside. The need for this region to speak more closely with legislators and others to be able to get the kind of funding that comes from a federal level is essential, and also to be recognized at the state level as a mover and a shaker is also critical that they realize the power of the Monadnock region as an economic driver. Um, one thing I've noticed about New Hampshire is that um, people are really very humble here and don't really tout often the, the, the great things that are here. And, and that's kind of a nice, um, and, 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 and definitely if you're religious, I think will get people into heaven. However, <laughs> for the pieces of the pie that lay on the table, um, I see a lot more, um, I'll say this clearly, a lot uh, more that could be directed here if we spoke in, in, in a kind of consortium with more power about what impact we do, uh, will have on the entire state's revenue and budget and employment, and et cetera. And I think, um, how we gain that credibility and, and the forcefulness is going to be important for the future of our, our students and, and, and our communities as we go forward. So um, critically, um, I think you Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Scott Peckins, the new guy at the Cheshire YMCA. And um, I just wanted to comment on the internship work study programs that briefly have been talked about. I've actually gone through them as a university uh, student many, many years ago, but now at the YMCA, we're going to need to do a lot of internships and work-study programs, and I've already met with Keene State with Mary Pleasanton, but I'd like to afterwards maybe leave you my cards and see if I could hook up, because we've got so many slots right now that we could utilize um, immediately, so I'd, I'd like to meet with you afterwards, but I think it's a great idea for not only hard skills, but soft skills as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I'm with the Red Cross locally, and uh, we work in partnership with all of these institutions. And so I think um, if you're the new guy at the Y, that's a really good thing to connect up with, um, with these four institutions. One example is um, we're working with Keene State to actually
actually offer online um, first aid and CPR training. And uh, one of the things that's interesting there is we do some stuff in online and then also some um, hands-on. So having the combination, we call it blended learning. And uh, that's worked well. Well, one of the classes that I don't quite understand, one of my employees took a class uh, online, public speaking. Yeah. Yeah. There was no classroom component. It was just an online public speaking class. So, you know, that maybe in my mind is going a little bit too far. Um, but anyway, it is interesting to just see how um, our community organizations can work very closely. It's mutually beneficial, whether it's the human element or whether it's um, the learning environment. And uh, we can do things really creatively together and lift everyone in the community by being collaborative. And it, and it really works. Collabor collaboration and creativity you know, go hand in hand. And collaboration is certainly the word of the day, you know, in terms of bringing efficiencies and uh, a greater breadth and, and depth of offerings. Um, with regard to, to blended learning, you know, we, we continue to try and push the envelope, so to speak, in terms of what we can deliver online. And uh, at my place, uh, the, the thinking has largely been around laboratory sciences. And, uh, and we have begun to do things like purchase laboratory kits and have online students buy those kits. And it's a test, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring. Um, I have heard about speech uh, being offered online, and yes, it gives me pause as well, but, uh, you know, I'll be open-minded and waiting for the, uh, for the research to come back. But uh, typically blended learning, or sometimes what we'll call hybrid courses, you know, uh, it, it seems to be uh, a viable compromise to having some education take place, uh, you know, over, uh, over the Internet and other uh, opportunities in class. Now, for us, you know, an institution that is very, very mindful of, you know, our students not being well off, by and large, and also coming huge distances, when gas hit $4.10 about a year ago, that was a real breaking point for students commuting to our campus. And that, in itself, caused a huge leap in the hybrid or the blended model, and relieving students of coming into campus for one of their two campus meetings. So we're driven by that in part as well. Maybe I could just add a comment about the, um, this train that's really left the station in terms of online teaching and learning. It, it's really not something we're going to turn back and go back to uh, the Blackboard and, and textbook. And a couple of interesting things to think about, and certainly people in, in the business uh, community are going to find an increasing percentage of your future employees will have a t uh, spent a considerable amount of their educational experience in online or in blended or hybrid courses. It's the fastest growing component of higher education by far. In fact, it's the only component. Uh, it's growing consistently at 12 to 15 percent a year enrollment in online courses, whereas enrollment in uh, traditional classroom-based courses is declining across higher education nationally. Um, a recent study just came out about six weeks ago from the U.S. Department of Education that aggregated the data from over a hundred very good individual studies of learning either in a totally online format, a blended or hybrid format, or a, or a, or a strictly classroom-based format. And the question was, what, how, which of those three approaches have the best student learning outcomes and the best student satisfaction? And far above at the top was blended or hybrid learning. The best student learning outcomes and the best student satisfaction and the satisfaction of the instructors was higher in blended and hybrid learning than in online or classroom-based learning. Second was fully online learning, and classroom-based learning was uh, pretty far down at the bottom in, in, in the outcome of that study. You can go to the U.S. Department of Education website and, and download the paper. It's an excellent paper. It's a, thorough piece of work, it's about 100 pages long, you have to wade through it. But you can just read the introductory uh, top page and get the, the sense of the findings of the study. So um, it's a huge part of how teaching and learning is going to happen in this country. It's, um, and we have to be very careful, I think, as we consider this, and we all know this. It, it, it,
it's not a black and white environment. There are plenty of really lousy classroom-based learning opportunities. I mean, many of our employees who are 40 to 60 year olds spent almost all of their educational experience in very didactic classrooms, the, the, the lecturer at the front of the room, no interaction, there, there wasn't team work going on in the class. And yet, we, we're thinking of them as having these soft skills that young people today don't have. I mean, there are other very interesting studies out there. Um, one comparing gamers, you know, young people in their teens and 20s who play a lot of video games, the real intense kind, like Warcraft, and, you know, these, and, and now they play them across the internet with people all over the world. So my son will be at home playing Warcraft with one of the other players is in Finland, another kid's in Argentina, and another one's in Denver, and he's sitting in Massachusetts. And um, gamers, when they get into the business world, are much better at teamwork, at collaborative project work, and so on, which is totally counterintuitive. You would think they're sitting in front of a computer screen six hours a day playing video games that's going to have the opposite effect. So it, it's a much more nuanced and sophisticated world we're entering into, and I think we really have to be really cognizant of that. And, um, I just wanted to make one other comment, because we've mentioned K-12 a number of times, and I appreciated your comment about going and working with the K-12 system. Um, everything has unintended consequences, and a big unintended consequence of No Child Left Behind, which has driven K-12 education to testing and teaching to the test, is, the, um, is that it's pushed the soft curriculum out of K-12. Industrial arts education is almost gone. The arts are vastly diminished, so you find far less music, drama, theater experiences. It's in those kind of things, in, as our young children grow up, where they really engage with each other in meaningful ways and get experience with those soft skills that we treasure so much and that we know are really valuable in, in whatever sector of, the, of our economy these people are eventually going to work in. So I hope people keep that in mind as they think about where public policy is going related to um, our government pushing K-12 education to uh, teach only mathematics and science in a very didactic and test-driven approach. Yeah. I had a question. They were just talking about that study of results. How did they define the blended or hybrid learning? What's their definition of that? Uh, I think you know, Stephen kind of capsulized it. Those are courses where uh, you know, the traditional classroom-based course in college requires three hours a week sitting in a classroom for a 15-week semester, that's about 45 hours a week of face-to-face -face contact in a classroom. And then for every hour in the classroom, you're supposed to require two hours of work outside of class. It's really a lecture and self-study. You know, there's three hours of lecture and six hours of self-study. And in a blended class, you just reduce that amount of face-to-face -face time. So it may be the class meets far less and more of the work is done in, in a technology-mediated environment across the internet um, there's all kinds of interaction tools that make that work well, both interacting with the teacher and, and, and students in the classroom interacting with each other. I just did not so, that definition of us. Any other questions? Oh, uh, one of you, yeah, please. I'd like to back up a little bit. Uh, my name is Scott Cashman. I work at the Yonzala Center in Keene, and also on the advisory committee at Keene High School for the Career Center. Um, we've spoken how the community leaders and yourselves, you know, talk back and forth. Do you communicate much with the high school as far as like the career center, the technical aspect of it, as to what what you can expect them to do to help the students entering your institutions? Uh, now we are.